I went through the usual sort of rounds of sort of chemical treatment and mm. radiotherapy and I began to kind of contemplate the metaphor of um, I suppose when there is disease why use blanket application so for a human body that's chemotherapy mm -hmm. when really all you're doing is trying to target a particular area yeah and then I started thinking about farming which is really the same so a farmer might have one small problem in their field but they put hundreds of thousands of dollars of harmful chemicals on the field like a blanket Okay, good afternoon everyone. We are here with Will Wells, founder of Hummingbird Technologies. Will, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, your, your parents were going for a superhero name. That is true. <laughs> I hope they're hopefully not too disappointed, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're here to talk about Hummingbird Technologies, obviously, but before we get there, let's uh, get a bit more info on, on you for our audience. So how, how, how do you get started on this, on this journey? So my background's in technology and, and finance. Um, I started Hummingbird when I was still at business school, um, which was in Seattle, just outside of Paris. Um, and before that, I, I'd worked for a hedge fund, um, managing their investments across Asia, um, with a particular focus on, on technology. Um, and I started in, in, in investment banking before that. Um, I had a couple of, of years out before my MBA, where I was spent two years in hospital thinking about what I wanted to do next. And that's where I really began to hone in on machine learning and mm -hmm. imagery analytics and disease control. Um, and that was the, the sort of genesis of Hummingbird, as it were. You have to talk about the hospital. Absolutely fine, yeah. That'd be great, so what, what, what happened? So it was a, so I unfortunately had um, very aggressive cancer um, that was malignant and, and spread. And I went through the usual sort of rounds of sort of chemical treatment and mm. radiotherapy and um, you know saved by modern day science and imaging oh. technology and MRI scans I, I began to kind of contemplate the metaphor of um, I suppose when there is disease why use blanket application so for a human body that's chemotherapy mm -hmm. when really all you're doing is trying to target a particular area yeah and then I started thinking about farming which is really the same so a farmer might have one small problem in their field, but they put hundreds of thousands of dollars of harmful chemicals on the field, like a blanket, um, which is obviously extremely harmful for everything else. Mm -hmm. um, and in retrospect, that was that was when I began to think about launching Hummingbird. That's amazing. And did thinking about Hummingbird and creating this vision help you think about something beyond the day-to-day -day treatment and your current like current circumstances? Absolutely. I mean, I had a such a clear um, want for life beyond the treatment room. Um, I'd always wanted to go and go back to university, and I'd always wanted to live in France, and I'd always wanted to start my own business. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, I guess, you need a bit of a shock like that to mm -hmm. give you the courage to actually put your foot forward. Um, you think, in, in retrospect, that if it hadn't happened, you you would, you know, you'd still be in. Yeah, that's banking. banking. I'd probably still be whinging at dinner parties yeah. about <laughs> how I hate my job and, and, and so forth. But I think it was the it was the, the kick up the ass that I needed. Um, but I also I also had a sort of all in mentality. I had literally nothing to lose because mm -hmm. uh. it was um, fairly life threatening at that stage. Yeah. So so um, I thought, well, if I'm gonna sort of be cut short, I've got to make the most of it. Yeah. But luckily, now that's passed me. Yeah. You're tip top. Ready to go? I, I hope so. I mean, yeah. we've I've done forty five flights since since November. We've <laughs> we've opened offices in um, Brazil and Australia and Russia and Ukraine, and I probably know the economy uh, sort of seats in most aircraft models um, <laughs> a bit too well by now. But other than that, and the effect on my um, sort of old thirty five year old body, yeah, I feel pretty good. Oh, it's, yeah. it's amazing that you made the correlation between um, the health and sustainability of, of like your own body and of agricultural ecosystems as well, because um, it, it needs you to take a step back and see the kind of wood for the trees to make an association like that. Um, Presumably you had some sort of interest and knowledge mm. in agriculture before that to even sort of make the analogy between your own condition and the fields. 
Sure. So my mum is a plant pathologist. She gives lectures on on medicinal plants. Um, she says she's a part-time hobbyist lecturer, but she's really very good. Um, so we talk talk about plants at the dinner table. Um, I've always been fascinated by technology, and when I was sort of co-managing the hedge fund, we we invested in early sort of satellite technologies and businesses that were beginning to flirt with machine learning as early as sort of 2011, 12. Um, it seems sort of omnipresent now, AI, but mm. really was much, much earlier. Um, in much earlier days, it wasn't mentioned as much. Um, because yeah, I was going to, um, my old flatmate worked at a hedge fund that used to tap into satellite data to try and, I think, do commodity spot pricing. Sure. So I was wondering if you'd had some exposure to that while working in the hedge fund industry that had also started to prime you. So there's a business in the US called Descartes Labs. Um, and they were born out of a CIA experiment to try and predict the yield of opium plantations. Mm. The idea is that they could predict supply in Afghanistan then they would understand like the local economy um, and that business then moved into commodity trading um, it's now been bought by Cargill and Hummingbird is probably one of only four or five businesses around the world that that know how to predict yield through satellite imaging so this is very much kind of a focus of our fintech focus as you were mm -hmm. of sort of Hummingbird 3.0 um, interesting because it must be extraordinary sums of money to be made for the small advantages that can go into those black box trading algorithms if they've got better data. For, for sure. I mean, it's extremely interesting for a bank or for an insurance company or for a commodity trading outfit. Um, Hummingbird's really just trying to help a farmer mm. predict their own yield and manage their own supply and forward price their own harvest better. Um, so we're on the sort of farmer side of the fence, but the algorithms and the models are the same. Um, a farm is really just an open balance sheet that you can see from space hmm. and it is a sort of conceptually low hanging fruit um, area to be to be won but it is very hard. Um, so to go to Ollie's point, you, from, from being ill to going to business school to, to starting to work on this idea, what were the steps after INSEAD that, that brought this to life? Sh sure, I mean I, I was very lucky in that I had my idea before I went to INSEAD and MBA schools are absolutely brimming with um, very clever people from McKinsey and Bain and places like that. So I bored everyone to death with my idea <laughs> and you know, everything from kind of customer acquisition strategy to what, what it would cost to route to market to which countries we'd focus on. I sort of went through the year with um, hummingbird in mind in every class so I felt like I was planning it for for, for a long time um, and then it really then became about kind of forming my initial team um, I've realized first and foremost that drones and satellites and robots were interesting from a hardware perspective but it's really the data science angle that's the sort of long-term winner so when I started the business I wanted to be somewhere which ended up being Imperial College that was right in the epicenter of sort of machine learning talent. Mm. And once I'd formed my ori original team that was myself and a couple of professors, we, we went from there um, and went and developed a proof of concept. Um, and, and, and that was it. And just a final word on the, the, the MBA experience. Do you think you derived more, because a lot of people criticize MBAs, not because they're without value, but just because it doesn't teach you the practical on the ground stuff that yeah. you would learn just by doing. But because you went into it with the idea in mind, do you think you extracted extra value? Oh, for, sh for, for, for sure. Um, so I've hired four of my year as well. So I right. met some of my founding team. Um, and whenever we, we... You we, didn't bore them too much then. We didn't bore them too <laughs> much. <laughs> Um, actually, a couple of them didn't join at the beginning, and then once they seen that we you know, <laughs> raised a little bit of money and they paid off their loans, they, yeah. they jumped ship. Um, but we, um, you know, we, we I think we have two Harvard Business School, four NCADs, and one London Business School. And you know, you, you've got to be a little bit careful not to saturate your management team with the same kind of thinking because that's mm. how the sort of financial crisis happened. But at the same time, they are extremely effective generalists mm -hmm. and 
if you're launching in a country and you need someone to be able to pitch and do a PL and yeah you know engage on the product and engineering side you do get very well-rounded people mm -hmm. um, and also people you can trust because we're in places like Brazil and Russia and you know bad things can happen mm -hmm. if you choose the wrong people and I can't keep an eye on, on everything all the time um, and, and with regards to getting onboarding professors and I say this because anybody who's listening who wants to get in something highly technical um, was it difficult to get them and their buy-in or did they come out of research to join your organization in a similar field so, so it always slightly surprises me how easy it is to get people to come and work for hummingbird because within data science you have so much cash being thrown at um, every sector and a lot of the workflows are quite boring mm. and trying to alleviate global food security and trying to identify disease so we don't put chemicals in the rivers and the fields and preserving soil for future generations these are some of the sort of last bastions of, of great kind of scientific conquest um, and people that are engaged in machine learning or deep learning or computer vision are constantly seeking an application for their science that, that is meaningful now there's very little risk for them as well because we all know that Facebook will snap them up in a heartbeat mm -hmm. and for Hummingbird they might not get paid as much but it is meaningful um, and they get some equity as well and you know you're 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 building something high profile and and potentially that you can be very proud of so engaging with professors or analysts from fresh out of UCL is, has always been nicely easy um, but we are competing with everyone now. It's it's definitely it's definitely ramped up since 2015 when I did my first hire. Right. And before we like jump into the technology a bit, can you explain from a farmer's point of view what your proposition is to to them? So Hummingbird uses imagery from satellites, drones, and planes. We combine that imagery with weather data and other information that we know about the field. And that information is provided visually as a map that a farmer can download into a shapefile that will allow them to plug into a tractor a means by which they can put more chemicals on areas that need more and less on areas that need less. So for example, if we detect water stress in a field, we provide the farmer with an irrigation map that just puts more water on the area that needs water and doesn't put anything on an area that doesn't need it. So it's a straightforward mathematical model um, that translates into a map that plugs into any farm equipment. Mm -hmm. And the advantages for the farmer is that they just get a precision approach to whatever they're trying to do. Exactly. So imagine you're a farmer and you spend 100 million a year. Now 10 million might be on labor, 15 might be on equipment, but mm. over 50 will be on fertilizer, herbicide, pesticide, water, seeds. These are your input costs. Now, all Hummingbird's trying to do is to stop the really big input mm -hmm. users, mm. use 10% less and achieve the same yield. So can we achieve the same result with less chemicals or can we achieve a higher result with the same amount of chemicals? Mm -hmm. And what you find is that you're, you're chipping away at a kind of $50 billion industry for each of those input streams very very powerful yeah business that we're that we're not going up against but we are fundamentally eroding because i assume there's information you can ascertain at the individual level which is you take a farm in isolation and improve the outcomes and practices of that specific farm and then i guess there could be something that you learn from another patch of land that can now be applied to this farm in terms of its rotation of its agricultural sustainability so to what um, level of fidelity do you do? Do you do on a case-by-case -case example, but or if you learn best practice somewhere else that they could incorporate into their pest-resistant regime, will you try and sort of advise the farms on, on that? So it's a great question. We, we don't tend to give the advice. So think of it like um, an oncologist, and we just provide the MRI scan that shows them the problem, mm -hmm. and then they adjust the treatment accordingly. So we deliberately don't, move into the realm of giving advice or giving sort of treatment mm -hmm. uh, prescriptions. But your question about does information from one farm 
or do observations from one farm help another absolutely so as we build a library of labeled machine learning um, well it's a, it's a it's a high quality large data set that is labeled so for example if we're looking for what a particular weed looks like um, it will help us if we've done it a hundred times on another farm and we do it another hundred times on another farm so the bigger the data set and the more observations and the more labels we have the better we get at it mm. at the moment are you working with a sort of a distinct set of of crops or, or or can you work for any 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 type so we focus on five or six crops i mean hummingbirds main vision is to um, use ai and imagery analytics to stop particularly the largest farms in the world from from being such an environmental burden yeah mm. on the on, on the landscape and so we tend to go for the big combinable crops so wheat barley um oilseed rape or canola sunflower corn potatoes mm-hmm. um now we don't just sell to farmers we sell to farming businesses so um if we're counting the number of potatoes in a field and predicting yield that's incredibly in- interesting for McCain or PepsiCo these guys control the potato supply chain um, if we are identifying um, a particular disease in a field that might be interesting to John Deere the tractor company because they have a b- piece of equipment that sprays that particular problem and what we find is that our users are farmers but our route to market and our actual customers are farming businesses whether it's Sainsbury's or HSBC or John Deere mm-hmm. or Unilever, mm. anyone with even peripheral exposure to, to farming has now been galvanized by this food security problem. Um, and we, we surf off the back of that. Right. What would you say your, your core business model is then? Core business model is um, software as a service subscription um, to farming businesses and their agronomists. So an agronomist is like a doctor that prescribes advice Mm. so an agronomist is quite scientific and will visit a farm once every few weeks and will advise on the chemical treatment okay we need to tap into that advisory network and Um, do they do they follow the practices quite well because there's a lot of criticism um, particularly i guess in second and third world countries of them knowing that they should be you know more careful with the applications of some pesticides and stuff like that but yet it doesn't doesn't change practices for some reason people are just still blanketing the land with with you know chemicals sure i mean it gets worse because what happens is that um plants build up a natural resistance to chemistry so what 100 kilograms of something one year will have to be 110 the next it's like any any any, exactly and with regulations that quite rightly in my view um try to restrict the use of of chemicals that are harmful for the environment or for bees for example what it does is it removes tools in the locker of agronomists so they have to use more of something else so we're veering towards this very kind of steep cliff edge where you know the tools are less in the toolbox people Mm -hmm. have to use more and they have limited effect and yet the demand for food has never been greater and with 10 billion people by 2050 it's, mm-hmm. it's not it's not going away mm-hmm. we um had a company raise money through us called weeding tech yes um which used hot foam to mechanically break down weeds which it, it, it's very difficult to build up resistance to a mechanical breakdown um but again they, they still got so much to do to to capture the market and obviously the market leaders are still these chemicals sure. and stuff like that and they've got a vested interest in presumably selling more chemicals um so how how bad is that problem become i mean like you said you know 100 tons one year 110 tons next year i mean how how much over prescription of these is going on i think the the challenge is is that the reality of farming is that you have incredibly narrow windows to solve problems that if they're untreated will destroy your crops and it's quite easy for us particularly in london to kind of sit there as a tech team and say oh it's ridiculous that this doesn't happen but there, people just simply don't have the time and this is where the technology comes in if you if you give a farmer a map that shows them where their problems are and where they're not and they can translate that map into a treatment map which uses less so they save money and they save time mm. they're going to use it mm. 
there's not a single farmer in the world that doesn't want to be more environmentally responsible. It's not it's not as though like there's a conspiracy against the environment. And perversely or not, what 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 we actually find is that the businesses that are built on agrochemical manufacturing, so Monsanto, Bayer, BASF, are some of the most innovative when it comes to rolling out this technology. So it's not as black and white as you'd think. And a lot of R&D that goes to potentially people like Weeding Tech, and I love, love those guys, it's such a cool product, mm. um, and Hummingbird comes from Syngenta. Um, it comes from people that traditionally are, are pushing out these chemicals. So I think that there's a real seismic change in their business models as well. And they're becoming life science companies that, that are about crop protection, not chemical manufacturers. And rather like BP or, or Shell moving heavily into renewables. Becoming energy companies as opposed to oil companies. Exactly. And we're seeing this, this, this change. It's very dramatic. And it's obviously good for the planet and good for farming. When you... Um first came up with the idea was it is it the kind of thing that you had to prove the concept for or were you convinced that the concept was going to work um but there was just so much technology to get in place before you could prove that so what what was like the, the hardest barrier that you had to overcome like in those early phases it's a, it's a great question so a lot of the science is proven it's the delivery mechanism that that we focus on so for example um, a hyperspectral camera is capable of detecting through spectral bands that basically you and I can't see. So it's beyond the it's beyond the the visible light spectrum that you and I look at things in, which is RGB. And using a hyperspectral camera, you can pick up things like disease in a crop. So if you look at the infrared narrow band, yeah. you can see in an apple an area of disease that looks completely normal to you and I wow what's the association between that spectral band and the disease is it something a chemical that it gives off or? It, it can be it's multifaceted but at a really basic level it's a lower chlorophyll count so uh -huh. um, if you re remember back to GCSE biology <laughs> um, a healthy plant will have chlorophyll and water flowing through it and will be turgid and there are all these traits that we look for in the code so weirdly if you're really close to a plant you can actually pick up a temperature change as well because water flowing through something will make it cooler hmm. so a plant is is like a human body if you know what you're looking for you create an algorithm but with a windy field in Lincolnshire and you're looking at a thousand hectares hmm. you've got to account for everything from the angle of the sun to the shadow on the plant to You've got a drone moving at 20 miles an hour. It's, it becomes a an engineering sort of feat that is not mm. um, it is not straightforward. The, the the algorithms and the and also the hardware are these just are they partners that you brought in as part of your delivery process, or have you developed some of this yourself? So, if if Hummingbird's product was a black box, our job is to ingest imagery from any hardware device. So an RGB camera on a drone or a hyperspectral camera on a plane or Sentinel or Landsat. So the European Space Agency are one of our investors. We pull data from NASA and European <laughs> Space Agency. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> and our job is to then analyze that and then put it anywhere. So whether it's a irrigation system or John Deere or something like that. Um, and do you do you look for the signatures with each piece of technology you interface with, or do you start to, to make novel recombinations of different, um, let's say, satellite and drone, or satellite field temperature drone, and you've built your own algorithms incorporating multiple um, data, data yeah, sources? Correct. It's all our own algorithms, and it's all proprietary. And the challenge is, is that, so with a non-data science background, at the beginning I thought, this is easy, we're just going to isolate the signature of a particular disease and we're, we're off and away. Now, a plant will behave completely differently depending on which growth stage it's in, or the climate, or the soil type. So you have these, these fast-moving goalposts that complicate it. So you have to break down the problem and almost come up with a different algorithm for every single situation. But I, the idea is that over the life cycle of a plant's growth, you look at it sometimes from a satellite, sometimes from a drone, and depending on what you're looking for, 
get the answer because mm-hmm. they rotate fields so I guess knowing what stage it is through its rotation you know it's years one two three where the nitrogen levels of the soil might be changing you need to know when it was planted so you can start to see patterns with that and then the yeah. associated weather patterns as exactly and then some problems have a memory so disease disease is weather driven generally uh-huh. but weeds come back in the same places so really if you know what happened the year before you can begin to predict what happens in the next year and then i guess the the realm that you want to get into is is mathematically being able to attribute a value to something so um we predict yield in the field therefore if you don't treat something with that problem this is your loss or if you don't use chemicals you're actually going to gain this Mm -hmm. and that will move kind of plant pathology into the realm of human medicine where people have enough data to really know that okay if we do this in this way then you're likely to do x to ollie's point what was the minimum viable use case that you built so your your test bed um crop field size was it in the uk so it was in the uk and the, the big test was can we spot problems from the air that, that are invisible to the human eye you mean drone not um satellite drone, or both? It, it began with sensors on drones um now what you get in resolution and kind of high specs with drones you lose in scalability so it became apparent pretty early on from a business model perspective that we had to have this kind of you know limitless global imagery source so the idea is that i can look at any field in the world right now and give you a pretty good idea as to what's in the field when it was planted and how well it's doing now from an onboarding perspective that is quite a neat trick and we're not quite there yet but we will very quickly be able to you know draw a polygon around a hundred mile radius area and tell you what's you know how many hectares of what crop and how well it's doing and so forth our cubesat's going to change that quite a lot they will and i mean t- from a satellite perspective the biggest change for us is something called synthetic aperture radar so that's um satellite imagery that can penetrate cloud cover so it looks through the clouds how does it do that I, <laughs> no idea no, literally no idea uh. but, it, but it, uh, the um it so the waves that are emitted penetrate the cloud and can pick up and read biomass and it doesn't work like sonar but it's similar to that that's 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 my best explanation now what this gives you is that instead of us being able to look at a field once every 10 days when there's no cloud cover we can look at it every day so imagine that eventually within a plant uh symptoms of disease are exhibited we can almost go back and pinpoint the moment that the inception of disease now if we can count the number of plants in a field and look at plants individually from space then we can treat them individually and then we've moved into completely personalized plant pathology it's it'd be a great breakthrough for humankind yeah, it really farming. would be it really would be do wow. you do you have any need for data like novel creations of data on the ground for instance do you have uh, designs on robotics that could go through the field and start to, to measure things that you haven't even thought of measuring yet or that you feel that there is a gap of of um, data so we have to ground truth everything um, at the beginning of a product so in order to calibrate kind of observations from the air with with what's on the ground it, it is quite a meticulous and expensive product development cycle but the idea is is that you know as your confidence intervals go higher Mm. and you get sort of 97 or 98 percent accurate let's say you Mm. can you can release the algorithm and once it's set up in a machine learning environment then it'll just get better and better um but we try and see everything from the air and not we, we don't like to rely on anything but any information that we get from the farm is helpful i suppose one interesting question is kind of how do we interact with things like driverless tractors and robotic weeding devices and the answer is is that the more technology that's on farm the more the more we're helped because all the devices talk to each other and the size of our data sets are a little bit too big at the moment to be processed live by drones but the idea is is that um definitely with 5g but 
any sort of um, sort of mobile network enhancement should allow, you know, a drone to fly continuously if it's solar powered, and be emitting that data to a, on in field device. What is the extent of IoT um, in a farm currently? Because I just have a guess in my head of how technological I think these farms are. When but was the last time you went to a farm? Um, <laughs> about two years ago. Right. Yeah. But you do, I just uh, like I project onto how technical I think they are. But when you're talking about a farm spending fifty million, one hundred million, I'm, I imagine it's way more technical than I believe. Yeah. So the the big guys are, are hugely technical. Um, they have combine harvesters that are worth a million dollars. Wow. It's proper. Um, you know, it's technology and engineering at its best. Um, in general, though, um, farmers don't get much signal on farms, so your app has to be available offline. Mm. So there's lots of things that you have to take into consideration. Um, upload speeds very slow, so we have to compress the data. We use every trick in the book to get the data into the cloud as fast as we can. So we try and guarantee a 24-hour turnaround because the objective is is how can we give a farmer insights or imagery on their farm way quicker than they could ever walk into the fields then you're solving a different problem as well so this whole this whole notion of um, you know if it rains and you want to know exactly what's going on in every field and you have it available on mm. your desktop by the time you wake up that's that's really the goal it's a sort of brave new world of farmers where the farmer never leaves his office in the top floor of his house. He's just got loads of screens and he's got the robot combine harvesters going and the drones flying above. It's, it's so cool. It's, and it's not far away. And um, I think the perception that, you know, somehow AI or robotics is going to erode farm labour is totally distorted because very few, very few people work on farms now. Mm. Um, we just won a client in Australia. It's the biggest farm in Western Australia. It's 200,000 hectares <laughs> in size. That's 15... Because they just go over those and they buy planes, don't they? Their farms are so big. Sure. And it's... I mean, that is... They have 50 staff. Um, wow. You know, it's it's an area that is at least, you know, five to, five to six or seven times bigger than the largest, you know, landowner in this country. Yeah. In terms of arable land. Mm-hmm. Um, and the scale is is unprecedented, and you know those farmers they they need technology just to know what's going on. Yeah. Do you have but do you have offices out there or, or is it, what's your sales route? Because obviously you're targeting these big farms. There must be a fairly limited number of them in each country. Sure. So in in Ukraine and Russia, for example, there's twenty farms that are probably you know the large agro holdings. They 50 to 100,000 hectares or above. Mm -hmm. Most of them are our customers now. Um, In Australia, similar amount. Many of them are livestock. We only do plants. And that's our sort of in in the code base. It's it's really all the plant pathologies, the the clever stuff. Yeah. So, um, you know, those are are our perfect target customers. Mm -hmm. Um, And we have, I think we have three people in Australia, four in Brazil, Mm -hmm. three in Ukraine and Russia, um, and the round that we're just completing now will probably double those team sizes. Right. And what's your your sort of sales strategy into those countries? Because I mean, is there a, is there a playbook that you run for each one, or is there a different pitch? So, t- it's a great question. So we try to tend we tend to stay very light touch, um, and we try to lock in the big players on proof of concept subscriptions to begin with. Yeah. So they might give us a few thousand hectares. It, it tends to start though at fifteen, twenty thousand dollar type contracts. It's not a sort of five hundred a year type, type yeah. thing. It's like buying a car, and we go from there. And you go for the products that you're, you know, that are best suited for them, and you can deliver the most value. Mm-hmm. And then you measure them. So one of our, one of the most important jobs for a hummingbird account manager is that you know if we did save them ten percent of this chemical cost. Yeah, we track it to yield and we give them a, a return on investment. Yeah. Are you incentivized in by the relationship they have with crop insurers and stuff like that? A, a little bit. Like, I think the industry has to evolve a bit more before there's a push-pull dynamic from, from let's say, the crop insurers. But what the business model that we want is where we can almost guarantee a return and we do it for free and then we profit share. So our, our view as a house is that you know, the customer acquisition cost or the sales cycle to get someone over the line when they're paying up front 
you know, is six to 12 months. And it's not an easy sell. Um, we've been growing at three or four times a year the last two years, but yeah, it, it, it's not like a hundred times growth. Um, do we have 5,000 customers coming to us every week? No, the industry's too young. But if we move into a world where we can give some assurance about the product working and say to farmers, look, let's just go 50-50, I think that's gonna unlock, that will unlock the real floodgates. Mm. Um, and we've seen it work a little bit in the US in our space. I was going to say the US must be a huge target because they have some gargantuan farms out there. It, it is and it isn't. I mean, I, pro I probably shouldn't be talking about our geographic strategy, but right. all sort of tech, tech crunch, crunch base sort of type um, growth strategies would suggest that the US is, is the place to be. Um, in reality, for your industry or just you mean generally for, for, for us right. I mean it's big big farming big budgets they love R&D they're willing to experiment um, we, we, we tend to have two or three other competitors globally they're, they're all in the US right um, we, we have single digit thousands of customers each mm -hmm. so it's not like um, the two million farmers in the US it's not like there's not room to grow yeah. but it's more saturated there and on, one, on the one hand, we think, well, if we're a tech company and we really want to win, then we have to go there and win eventually. But on the other hand, there are markets like Poland, Czech Republic, Romania, Slovakia, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Kazakhstan, India, totally wide open. And there's a huge need for what we're doing. So we constantly debate as a board and a management team, you know, do we go and become the sort of global leader X US or, or do we go there? But presumably there's a race to get your hands on as much data as you can to perfect the algorithms. And then if you're training it Europe through Southeast, Southeast Asia, then the weight of experience and data you can then export <coughs> into the US makes you more viable than the, the local solutions potentially. A absolutely. And there's an advantage to being internationalized. So um, I'll try and give you an easy example. So oilseed rape or canola flowers once a year. This is when everyone, when everyone goes on Instagram and takes the photos of, of the yellow flowers. And from the further south part of England to the furthest north, it's about a three week gap between the earliest flowering plants and the latest. So over a, over a calendar year or over a season, you've, you've genuinely got a month of oilseed rape flowering. Now, imagine that was my only product and I was a data science team. I'd have one chance in a year to iterate and improve the models. Mm. So what Hummingbird's done is we've positioned ourselves in a sort of geographic arc from Canada, Ukraine, Russia, UK, Australia. And we have Northern and Hummus Southern Hemisphere. So we're doing the same problem uh, five or six times in a year. That's so smart. So over time, we should win. And <laughs> when we do enter the US, it will be with the best product for what we're doing yeah um and we do potatoes everywhere for example everywhere grows potatoes mm -hmm. so we try and we try and choose things that that are that are global commodity crops mm -hmm. um with big problems yeah perhaps a little bit unsexy but um from a data science perspective you know we, we give ourselves the biggest chance yeah just as a side question what is oilseed rape used for is it biofuel so it's used as a substitute for for more harmful or more fatty oils in food. Okay, so it's a cooking, is it? Okay. So rapeseed oils um, are, are used in many, many different um, foods that you and I will eat. Okay. Um, and you talk about yourself as the the cure, I guess, at the moment. It seems that you're you're helping people understand what's going wrong. Um, will there be a move to helping people optimize yields? You know, to take a farmer and you know give, give them a means of of actually improving. A, upon current practice, I know you said you weren't going to go into that or weren't in that space yet, but when you get enough data, um, is it something you're interested in doing? Definitely. I mean, we are, we're part of a revolution and we're definitely one of a number of really interesting companies that are doing what, what you said. Um, you know, whilst it doesn't seem so from the outside, what we're doing is still quite narrow. Um, and there are other problems like food waste, for example, mm. or DNA sequencing and plant genomics and areas that we, that we, that we, that we sort of touch on. 
um, but are ultimately different sectors. And we're all trying to solve the same problem, um, which is how do we feed 10 billion people and not destroy the planet? Um, or how do, we, how do we do it and not make it totally unsustainable so that we, we cause irreparable damage and future generations have an even bigger problem? Yeah. Now that will be a death sort of from a thousand cuts mm. type mm -hmm. solution. Um, does that answer the question? I'm well, it's, it's, it's really complicated because I was, I was reading that I think potatoes are one of the highest, um, most high efficiency conversion of, of, you know, organic material to calories, which, you know, begs the question, if we need to feed the planet, plant more potatoes and make sure that they can grow and stuff like that. And um, at university, we studied the cotton industry in the USSR and then the subsequent draining of the RLC. So it's all very well to look at the, the sure. cotton thing and say, how do we optimize it? But then... You, I guess what I'm trying to understand is maybe we need just a, a reshuffling of the the map at some points where you kind of think well, we're really struggling to grow this crop in this desertified area. Of, again, I was reading California. Sure, they grow things in the sort of California valleys where there's so little water to almond, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, it's really water intensive. Well, almonds kill bees as well. Do they? Because they, when they're pollinated, they don't give back nectar, so a bee will die if it continues to pollinate almonds. So when our, fa our farms in Australia have almond plantations and the farmers leave out um, uh, troughs of water with sugar in so the bees can... Oh, right. Um, right, which are such little changes, but they can make a huge difference. Sure. Because presumably if the bees start dying out, then they... They will die, don't they? Well, it, it, that, is, that is what Einstein said. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're all part of this, this circle. And I think one of your questions was, what do we tell our audience and... We, we would love for the conversation to be started and for people to start questioning like where did their food come from and what resources went into its production. So if I'm buying, you know, a fashion garment and cotton was grown in India to produce it, you know, was water drained from a lake to irrigate the cotton and, you know, were the people that picked the cotton paid properly and were they spraying pesticides with the proper protection? Mm -hmm. And... Hummingbird is only able to influence uh, crop production before it gets harvested. So with potatoes, we can count the number of potatoes in a field and see where disease is. And if you think that 30% of the potatoes don't even make it into the supermarket shelves because they've got the wrong skin finish or they're the wrong shape, we're trying to s help solve some of those problems. But people don't often pay attention to what happens in the field and what went on the crops yeah um, and we wish there was a, a way in which we could hover an iPhone over a plate of food and we could see what chemicals went, went into what um, but having the conversation we probably wouldn't is, eat anything then <laughs> I think I mean I, I I am blown away every time I visit a farm and you know it is it is a um, you know you get farmers that are incredibly um, environmentally conscious and they care deeply about the food they produce and the quality. Um, but, you know, there is um, another side to that, and, you know, it's it's not a pretty sight. Um, it seems like sustainable agriculture always wins out in terms of if somebody can implement that system, it's robust. And some farmers, I think there's like some guy in Texas who switched his, his farm to, a, like, very biodiverse, sustainable, grew lots of variety of different things. Um and in some cases, we're able to prop up monoculture, but to what to what detriment? You know, what's the, the, the downside of that? And I guess my interest is how, how much are you seeing people being willing to switch to sort of sustainable farms with you know, good rotations of crops and stuff like that? Or do they double down on the idea that they can keep supporting potentially an unsustainable ecosystem? I think that farming is, is a, a sort of hand-to-mouth existence and... A lot of a lot of people don't have the the sort of luxury of a big a big pivot, and often moving to a much more sustainable method of rotation, um, you get a few down years before you see the results, and not many farms can sustain, you know, two or three years of losses in a mm. row. Um, if you add kind of global commodity price um, uh, variation to that equation, it's highly unpredictable you've got the weather as well so you have these huge sort of external s systemic shocks that mm. that make make matters harder um and actually the 
one of the trends that you see a lot is that if something is produced really sustainable, sustainably and it has a higher cost, then if that price is, is passed on to the consumer, what we're finding is that people just don't buy it. And people do care, but they just buy on price. Mm. And we see this time and time again. You're always going to have your 5% organic shoppers, but by and large, people buy on price. And um, it is it is a perpetual challenge for the industry. Mm. Um, well, I think what you're saying is most people don't have the luxury of choice. And, and you're right, it's so easy to blame farmers for not changing. It's so easy to blame consumers for not changing. But for a lot of people, they, their, their weekly shopping budget is probably very hamstrung. Sure. I mean, the, there's, a, there's a sort of, there is hope. So um, we work a lot with water companies and we work a lot with the government. So the government recognises that a farm that uses Hummingbird's AI to identify problems is a farm that is using evidence-based decision-making. Mm. So we get subsidised for that. Um, water companies that don't want nitrogen flowing into the rivers that they have to then treat and consumers sue them um, are also pushing us out on farm. And... It, particularly in, in Europe because it, it is much more environmentally conscious well the EU is if post Brexit we will regress mm. um, but um, you know we are we are sort of being galvanised by other stakeholders in this it's you know the farmer is a decision maker but they're not the only ones it's interesting I guess you're almost suggesting that there's the rise of a genuinely appreciable green economy because I know they had carbon offsets which were arguably a disaster but as soon as people can start realizing the economic um downstream effects of nitrogen leaching to the water and then subsequently having to clean that water you can start to work out whether subsidi subsidies are best applied Abs absolutely and in places like australia there are sort of murmurs that carbon matter and carbon content in the soil will be um rewarded and it's a very hard thing to measure but um this sort of soil and water system based um, metrics um, and ways in which farmers can be subsidised for being responsible and um, if if there's enough traceability to what they're doing, mm -hmm. um, you know this this is this is absolutely fantastic for companies like us because um, we're sort of a, an important part of that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, where are you at now? You've just you just closed a, a big funding round. So, what does your trajectory look like for the next sort of twelve, twenty four months? So we're in five countries, and there's just under forty of us. Um, over the next year, um, having just raised a, another ten million dollar round, hmm. um, you've just done that. We've 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 just done that in 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 the last few weeks. Um, or we are closing that as as we speak by the time we publish it and exactly and um we you know we need to double down on 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 our teams in overseas markets um you know we're a leader in machine learning but you know you're only a leader as long as you don't get caught and mm -hmm. um we plan to augment that that advantage um there are other solutions for other crops that we want to develop um and all of this involves um, a pretty relentless kind of travel schedule and we need to hire another 30 people, I think. Right. Um, you know, and, but we, we, we carry on doing what we're doing and, and um, you know, tr trying to sort of lead from the front-ish in this, in this really exciting space. Um, How did you get the attention of the European Space Agency? I think what the European Space Agency liked about Hummingbird was how we were trying to democratise satellite imagery mm. for the greater good, um, i.e. what we wanted to do was to push out satellite imagery and actually give it for free to farmers in return for machine learning based observations. So you have three fields and we give you some images of those fields and you help us a little bit in, ter in terms of training our algorithms, mm. telling us what growth stage the crop's at or, or what the yield was. And then we use that as a, um, a way to capture a large part of the market and then we upsell high resolution, highly scientific products that involve UAVs or, or basically imagery that's high resolution. So they liked our, our vision of using satellite imagery as, as a hook um, and pushing it out as far as we could. 
Um, but they also like the way that we combine different imagery sources and over a time series and we jump from three meter per pixel resolution down to a millimeter per pixel resolution. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive um, or competing sources of imagery. They, they complement each other. Mm. And is the, the, the satellite data, um, what's the financial relationship between you and the European Space Agency? Do they just give this data away for free for people to use? So in accounting terms, it's, it's a revenue contract. It's really a grant. And the grant is a matched grant that will put 50% of a round raised uh, back in. So I think we last did a, you know, three and a half million pound round, of which half of it came from them. So, you know, that gave us the the sort of the roadmap um, and the runway um, that we wanted to to fully integrate satellites into into what we're doing. But it's also a scientific honour to have the space agency and you know, you sort of grow up as a child reading about NASA and it seems like so far away but actually these people are quite normal and mm. they work in Oxford and yeah and and you pick up the phone and talk to them and sort of try not to like panic <laughs> that's great um credibility for you guys to have that and I know it, it tied into something with Ed, that Ed wanted to ask before about when um, we terraform Mars because you've got that link in they'll be using your data to 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 get Matt Damon growing the crops out there probably Lo I'd, I'd love for Matt Damon to be a board advisor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I think what's also nice from a visibility perspective of sometimes um, investment into space technologies can seem an awful lot like launching rockets to go and explore the solar system. But when you see a space agency appreciably giving back in a sort of downstream technology fashion, you know, yeah. uh, people famously talk about NASA building the Saturn V and then the technology drip from that powering loads of applications that we subsequently benefited from so i think we've noticed a, uh, an increase in the amount of things that the european space agency is starting to become involved with that are really exciting definitely and they're really trying to encourage an ecosystem to be built around satellite imaging um the commercial reality though is i think um planet labs are the biggest private satellite imagery company and you know they won't say it on their website but CIA are probably the biggest customer hmm. um, and what we're trying to use is you know we're trying to access military grade imagery to help solve environmental problems one of the challenges is that there's a sort of 15 year time time gap between particularly on drones I mean drones is even worse because you know right now it costs me let's say 500 quid a day to send a drone pilot into a field um, to am I, watch. Am I right in thinking you have your own fleet of drone pilots? So, overseas, all of our farms fly themselves. So, the business model can only work if data collection is, is done by the customer. Um, so, we only do the analytics and processing. But in the UK, we have, I think we have 50 pilots and okay. you know, 50 drones or something. I, I, I lose count. But we, um, I think we did 10,000 flights last year without any safety incidents. But it is a high cost exercise and we, mm. we mainly do it in, in the UK for R&D. Mm -hmm. But something called beyond visual line of sight, mm. drone, um, autonomous drone flying is absolutely bulletproof um, safe technology that's existed for decades in the military. And it would, it would, it would um, lower our cost of data collection by about 90% if we were allowed to do it. So the idea is that a farmer would just launch a drone go back into their farm office, do whatever they're doing for a few hours, and the drone would land, and they'd pull out a USB stick and upload the data. Now, none of our pilots actually fly the drones. They're just watching them for regulatory purposes. Unfortunately, the UK is now uh, light years behind other markets, so the US and um, other places have now allowed this. So it's a, it's a bit of a frustration for us. So it's government policy that you can't do... Um, BVOL. It's BVLOS. BVLOS. So it's yeah. Civil Aviation Authority um, regulation, and they're part of Department for the Transport. Um, but of course, with Gatwick and mm. other yeah. Daily Mail yes. sensational um, sort of drone incidents, it's it's a sort of dirty word. Because because we had um, Ed Klinger, who his company is Flock Cover. They do yes. drone insurance, and he I remember him talking about beyond visual line of sight. And I, I, I came out of the conversation thinking that it was allowed. I'm, I'm obviously not right. I'm not it, questioning it. I just 
So Amazon have uh, a sort of proof of concept pilot going, and I, I believe um, they're doing it a little bit in the Crossrail tunnel. But it's not it's not something that's kind of being tested at commercial scale. Mm -hmm. um, of course, in the middle of Ukraine and Brazil, it's it's a slightly different problem, and you know there's there's um, different regulations there, and 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 a much more a much more relaxed environment. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we use a plane though, so we don't really. It's it's not really about the hardware. It's about okay. the imagery and and whatever's the most scalable or most affordable. Well, what is your view on this? So you mentioned the arms race with sort of an AI tech company that presumably you can gain advantage very quickly if you start to, to pull in more data points. Sure. You can exponentially leave the the competition behind. But with something like this, where regulation potentially is is impacting you, um, how serious a threat is that to your business model, where you're not being able to get access to the the price points or volume of data? And what can you do to speak to the government to maybe change that? I mean, we we have um, lobbied or discussed or um, you know with very sympathetic ears at government level. Um, they are sort of the Civil Aviation Authority are overwhelmed, um, mm -hmm. you know, with with sort of public uh, exposure and particularly after the Gatwick incident. So it's just probably not high that high up on the agenda. Um, it's not necessarily a risk to us. It's more just be pure upside because mm -hmm. we we're already sort of being um, punitively um, well. We're already at a disadvantage, let's say, to like a U.S. company operating in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But we still manage to grow it three or four times um, mm. we'd be able to grow it ten times in the UK with it and just from a hummingbird perspective we we internationalise very early so we're already um, I think 60% of our revenues will be overseas this year so what will your position be on acquiring companies that may be interesting um, lateral vertical integrations into your existing technology as you grow like you found somebody who was excellent with a specific crop in a specific country for sure I mean we're we're looking at one acquisition in Brazil, um, a sort of sugarcane uh, gap detection, machine learning counting, a specialist. It's really a PhD with a one sort of one man and his dog company. Um, we're looking at something in Australia. I think the the incentive is is still do it yourself, mm. just because we we galvanised so much momentum now, um, and we certainly don't see much of a threat. It, at least in the UK, so it's it's sort of wide open. That's really exciting. Mm. Um, we can go into this sort of future gazing. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you, so you had to. What time did you? Say, I can't remember what time it was when you said you had an hour and ten minutes. It's now twenty. I probably three. got two or three more minutes. Five okay, to five minutes. okay, oh. that's all right. Yeah, but, let, let's hey, go for the dose then. Right. So we're just going to go into a series of quick fire questions now, um, yeah. mindful of your time. Um, is there uh, a prediction that you have for the future? Solar powered robots and drones autonomously managing farms um, and for the greater good. Do you have a date of the prediction? 2021. Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, Oof, that's the really near future. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. Um, a startup book that you recommend? I think the Lean Startup is probably quoted a lot on this podcast, but I think the Harvard Business School MBA program has been sort of rewritten around it and certainly helped me a lot um, and last the best piece of advice you've given or received so we had the Spotify one of the Spotify founders came to our office a year ago and took me aside and said will you know your biggest challenge as a CEO is pressing the reset button and every time you raise a round or double your team you know you have to become double the CEO that you were before and sometimes the people around you with the perfect guys to get you to the A round or B round, but they're not the people that are meant to lead after. And your your your, your goal is to know and know when to press the reset button and to do it yourself, but mm. also recognise when people can't. Um, and it's a sobering bit of advice that you can't just sit back and rest. My my job now as a CEO of almost seventy people by the end of this year is going to look so different to what it did at the beginning. Yeah. So I have to up my game. Hmm. I have one question I'm going to sneak in because we've got through this quite quickly. Um, are you optimistic for the future with climate change and other issues um, on the, the near horizon? If, if I consider machine learning in the context of what we're trying to do, yes. But 
unbridled in other sectors, possibly not. Um, we are um, grappling with extremely complex and powerful technology that's moving far quicker than we can. Um, and you know that power needs to be checked at some point. But for little old hummingbird trying to see problems in fields with AIs, I think we're pretty safe. Uh, and, and finally, is there anything that you would like to ask our listeners before you go? I think we'd love to ask all of your listeners to lobby and and demand from food retailers and and everyone in the food chain. You know, where do they get their produce from? What went into it? Start the conversation and encourage that push pull from 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 the consumer sector mm -hmm. um, because it's only going to help the adoption of this and and thereby kind of enable more sustainable farming practices yeah we're with you on that well thank you so much thank you so much joining us thanks for having me